Hello, everybody. Good afternoon. Is everybody listening? OK, cool. So let's go. I'm going to talk about a little bit of legacy code, how to evolve some web legacy code. We're using micro frontends and discuss a little bit of microservices or micro frontends and web components. So first of all, my name is William Grazo. I am a web developer. I am in the IT area for more than 15 years. Not that it completely matters, but yeah, I have a, a long road uh, behind of me. And I'm, I have been working with backend, frontend, but in the last five or maybe 10 years, I'm most dedicated to frontend, single page applications, and progressive web apps most, most lately. So uh, I. And last year, I, I started to work, I had the title of Google Developer Expert. It's a program from Google to uh, help people that are sharing their knowledge with the community and be, are considered some expert in some subject. If you want to talk about a little more about it, if you are sharing your knowledge with communities, uh, let's talk with me later that we can make something together. And I run the Angular SAP Meetup. It's a very big Angular and TypeScript community here in Sao Paulo, one of the biggest in Latin America and maybe in the world. So it's a community driving meetup. If you want to make part and share your knowledge, what you, are, you have been studying, please come meet with us. And first of all, it's not a talk about a silver bullets and truths. Uh, it's a talk about what what uh, we are doing in our company and the, all the proof of concepts we have been doing, all the studying, and the things that we are pathing, we are choosing, and directly we are taking. It's not something about how you should definitively do your job, and uh, everybody has its context, so let's put it in place. First of all, I work in Itaú Unibanco. It's a big just bank in Latin America. It's uh, one of the big just banks in the world. And we have there an innovation group. And we are doing some, a lot of new things and doing some new stuff. So it's not, I'm not working with COBOL and mainframe. Not worth thinking about. And so, and because of that, we have one of the big just web legacy. Uh, assistance in Brazil, probably one of the biggest legacy systems in the world, one of them. So, and when we talk about legacy, it's not that always, it's always something bad. It's not always that, uh, always a bad decision. Uh, we have a lot of great things there, but we, nobody really gets everything right every time. And we have a lot of good people working there for generations. A lot of smart things that did a lot of good things there. But nobody takes everything right every time. So, and the bad things, they peel off with each other. And sometimes you can, you can get struggle. It can be very hard to deal with some things. And sometimes you just need to take a calm down and understand what's happening with your context, how are your stack, and where do you want to go? What can we do right here from where we are? And how can we go to the place that we want to go? How can we evolve and adopt new stacks, new technologies, and continues to be, and mainly when we are talking about bank, how to go digital and uh, do all the new stuffs and do, uh, bring new features fast for the clients. So the first things we want to learn with the new things are the practices of the market. There is a lot of things that we were doing very good for a long time. For example, Itaú has uh, one of the lowest tax of fraud in Brazil and all over the world in the international banks. But there is a lot of things that we can improve. That's a lot, a lot of things that's not bad, not good. Uh, but at the same time, we can't just adopt the the newest hype of the moment. It's just impossible uh, for, for a lot of reasons. And some of them is that it can be just another bad decision that will pile up with the other ones that we got in the past. So to take, to take care about it, to learn and analyze all these things, we have on Itaú uh, a community. The name is Digital Foundation. It's a whole community that right there we have this squad likes uh, groups, teams. And we have a group of squads that makes a community. And the, uh, in Digital Foundation, we don't deliver normally software to the final client. If you are a uh, client of Itaú, we don't deliver for software for you most of the time. 
we actually do, uh, we test out new technologies and we discover how can they apply to our context. Uh, we do a lot of proof of concept with all new tools that we can find in the market. And we build a lot of tools, internal SDKs, components, and a lot of things that enable these tools to be used on, on our context and uh, standardize the things so everybody can start tests and don't, don't uh, hit your heads on the table every time when they want to start some new thing. And so we are not. Uh, the only community, the only squad doing that on Itaú, we have a lot of different areas on our IT uh, area that are doing amazing work with uh, new technologies, but we are community just focusing on that. Uh, that's our whole job is to do that. And we have a very big team on front end. Actually, now it's two squads just focus on front end inside the digital foundation. And that's that talk, that's talk is actually uh, a lot of all the things that we have been studying and doing some proof of concept with the subjects that are the title of this talk, which is mostly micro front ends. So uh, this is the newest hype of the moment on the front end community. If you don't listen about that yet, so you are living in, below a hawk, I don't know where it was. But <laughs> what exactly is that? Every time we had a, a talk before about it. So, Maybe some of them of you already know a little bit about it, but what it is? Is it a tool? Is it a library? Is it a framework? Is it just a hype? Maybe. <laughs> well, the, what people normally say is that micro front end, it's more of a concept, it's an architectural pattern. So, uh, and they normally say that the idea seems to bring the microservices idea to the front end. So how can I apply these patterns, all these things to the, fr to the front end? It's simple, right? Very simple. So, well, still too vague, and for us was very vague. What does it mean? How can I apply that? So what means to use microservice on the front end? So, but if everybody's talking about this, it could, should be cool, right? Can, it must be cool. And so let's research about it. Let's see how can it apply to the, our context. And uh, one of the things that I like to do when I am researching some new things, I seek to the source. Who are the, the, the zero patients? The, the, the source of it, who was the guy that first said about it? Discussed it, wrote some article or something. And the first reference that we, uh, we found about this topic, or topic you use in searching, using Google, was that is the same that the last guy said, the thought works harder. So that was the first reference in 2016, uh, and they first put that on the first level of, uh, of they, they have some scale about technology, and I'm not uh, explaining this scale, but the first one is just hold, don't use, it's probably bad for you, and more they, they go to the other side, it's adopt, it's something that you probably should be using right now. And they, they uh, first put it on, that on access that it's just after the hold. So, first reference that we could find. And after that, after this uh, radar, uh, we saw a lot of different blog posts and articles and a lot of people started to, to talk about it. And even this website here, microfrontend.org, it's one of the references that most of the people are using. So, okay. And then, in 2018, uh, it went from, uh, to what was the thing? It was it went from access to a trial, and then just after the, this year in 2019, it was for for adopt. So, uh, and even there was a big article on the Martin Fowler's website uh, talking about micro front end. It was not written for, by Martin Fowler, but it's on his website. So I, I believe he at least read, reviewed, and agreed with the content. So. Uh, so, looks like it's mature enough to use, right? Everybody should use that. If thought were said, we should be using. Well, let's research a little bit more. Until this moment, we couldn't find even a wiki page about it. We couldn't find a manifest, you know, that uh, reactive manifest or agile manifest when, where a lot of people that come together with some references on this topic to agree about the, the main topics about something. So, there isn't. We couldn't find a book 
normally there is uh, good to have a book about, with a strong references with the tale of implementation. Well, there isn't. And actually a lot of people, different people who seems to be using the same term to talk about different things. Sometimes totally different things. And some articles completely disagree even the principles. And actually we found a lot of fights on, on Twitter of big engineers of big tech companies fighting and even saying that it's completely bullshit that you should not use micro front ends as at all. For example, that guy is the creator of Webpack. It's working, it's a tech leader on Microsoft right now. And for example, the Dan Abramov, uh, one of the creators of React and one of uh, the main engineers on Facebook and even engineers, big engineers, famous engineers from Google and other companies totally disagree with everything and say that you shouldn't use that. So we were like, man, <laughs> what the fuck? What is happening? So we should use or not? Is it mature or not? What's working? What's happening? So let's put it on aside a little bit and let's discuss about the evolution of web, uh, of the architecture of the web. So first of all, in the beginning we had Monolith, the monolith, one piece that holds together the front end, the back end, the database access, and everything, sometimes even at the same file. <laughs> so, did you ever see that? <laughs> I have been on there a lot of times. So, then, then we started to, to work with single page applications and progressive web apps, and at least we divided the front end from the back end. And then some, at least the front end guys was happy, happy because they couldn't do their work alone, and they, could, they just needed to agree with some API interface, and cool. Um, and then the back end said, whoa, we can do that too and they wanted to divide everything on their back end uh, in different, uh, focusing on different things. And normally with an aggregation layer that could be on BFF and GraphQL or something like that to expose the, the microservices API to the front end. So it may be just normally to, to take this part, this last part, to evolve to it. It can be, it, it doesn't mean that the, the, uh, the, the front end and the back end are, uh, are close together again in a single file, it doesn't mean that, but it means that we could have uh, focused things working on different parts of the system that they can be autonomous and they can do their parts of, parts of the front end at the back end at the same thing, even if they have different maybe repositories or uh, people specialized on each part of it. So I think that's cool. I think that's something that we can work how somehow, work on somehow. So that's the core idea of micro front ends. It does that cut, that cut. And I believe that uh, there is a, a lot of different ways that we do that, can do that. So that's the thing that most people, most of the people seem to agree when they're talking about micro front ends. But there is some secondary points that people agree more or less, not everybody agrees, but let's talk about some of the main points of it. So first of all, autonomous thing. I believe that everybody agrees that autonomous things is a great thing. It's a great thing to, to as a team, can decide the things that you need to do and uh, your strategies and everything else. So, uh, but one of the things that I always thought about is, is micro front end or microservices and all these things, the only way to achieve autonomous, not necessary, but something that's really good that we could, we need to seek. And they normally what they are talking about is independent deployment. I think that independent deployment is much, much more important at the back end uh, than it's in, in the front end. There is much more case where the back end benefits on independent deployment than the front end, but even in the, the front end it can be good, it can bring a lot of value. So it's something that we can do with or without micro front ends that we could seek for. And they normally think about the code, uh, code base. Almost all the articles talking about micro front ends, they are talking about the code, uh, code base. And there, that's are the places that I personally start to disagree. I don't think that necessarily it's, it's a good thing or 
to do micro front end, we necessarily need to have the Copilot code base, but I will talk more about later on the on this talk. Let's move on. And they normally think one of the things that a lot of people do doesn't necessarily agree, but a lot of people talk about is technology agnostic. What this means is that each microservice team, they should uh, be free to use their, uh, their own framework, their own stack, their own dependence, and they should be completely decoupled from each other. Even if the both teams are using React or Angular at the same version, they could have their own tree of dependence. So if the other team, team would like to move on, it doesn't need to talk with the other team. So I personally think that it's a little bit strange, but Let's move on. So that's one example from microfrontend.org. Um, uh, it shows that at the same page, in this case on e-commerce, we have the product page, and we have two different three teams working at the same page with different objectives. So we have the team product, which are this, its responsibility is to show the details of the page and all the, the things related to the project, and they choose it Angular. And so you have the checkout uh, team that doesn't not only take care about the checkout page, but also everything that related to checkout, like the checkout button and the other things there. And they choose at React. And the, at the other part, you have the Spire team, the team Spire that cares about uh, suggesting a new product, and they choose View. And they are everything together in an e-commerce and everything together here at the same page. Who here? thinks that is a good idea. Please raise your hands. I see two people. Well, let's talk about web performance a little bit. Let's put aside the, the, the micro front end things and let's talk about performance. In average, mobile sites have takes up 15 seconds to load on mobile phones. It's too much. It's very too much. It's, it's a long time. So, and, and at the so other side, 53% of the users leave your website if it doesn't load in three seconds. Compare three seconds with 15 seconds, that's the average. Average means much people are doing much more than that. So, and, but if you can achieve the time to interaction in at least five seconds, a lot of it's statistics from Google and a, and a lot of other sites, they say that you can earn 7% longer sessions, you can earn 35 less rejection rate, and you can have 25% more visibility on advertisement. So the web has a lot of things, a lot of unique things that uh, a native app or other kinds of app uh, you will never have. But all these things that are unique to the web, they uh, really need performance. It's m much, much important to have performance in a website, in, in a website, in a web app, in most of the cases. So in JavaScript, it's actually one of the biggest villains of performance. Most people don't know that 20 kilobytes, to 200 of kilobytes of images, it's totally different from the same uh, size of JavaScript. When you load an image of this size, you take just the time of downloading it, and after that, it's almost instantaneously uh, rendered on your page. But after you download the same amounts of JavaScript, it takes some time to parse the JavaScript. The V8 doesn't start to run it right off the time, right off the download. It takes some time to kind of compile and understand what's happening on your JavaScript. And it's time, it's probably longer than you, than you imagine. There is some data from Google, some, some Google engineers, that shows that in average, uh, the same size of JavaScript, these 200 uh, kilobytes of JavaScript, takes in average almost two uh, seconds just to parse the JavaScript in an average mobile phone. And in the lowest uh, uh, targets, it can take even six seconds just to parse. That's too much, just to parse, before try, trying to execute your page. So, and to achieve these five seconds of time to interaction that we just talked about, the maximum JavaScript that you normally, they normally suggest you to load is 300 kilobytes of JavaScript. It's a maximum acceptable for an average mobile phone. So, but normally you deliver much more than that, much more than that, even using one framework, we deliver much more than that. 
Uh, there is a lot of examples of real sites like CNN that really cares about performance and a lot of times they are trying to improve and improve their performance on the web, but even they can take longer, longer times to, uh, to load their JavaScript. And it's very common to a lot of Brazilian sites and international sites. Performance is hard. It's too hard. And it's difficult to get there, and it's even, it's even easy to, to win that after it's good. You can do a lot of, a, a long, great job to prove the performance of your website, and after that someone just install a new dependency and blow up everything. So, it's common. And, but for most of the cases, performance is important to the success of a web application. So, let's talk about performance in the context of micro frontends. Who here still believes that it's a good idea? Man. <laughs> Each framework, more or less in average, it has 30 kbytes of JavaScript compressed alone, just the framework. Not only Angular, okay, Angular normally is one of the frameworks with the most, uh, the big just payload, but not only this. Uh, we have a lot of uh, options, even on the React side, the, like the Inferno JS and not some others that tries to load that uh, even more, the payload of React and all the frameworks that we have there. So if you have three frameworks at the same page, it will cost one third of the maximum that you could have to achieve the five seconds to interact. That's too much. It's, for me, it's completely unacceptable to have that if you care about performance. This uh, way of doing micro front end with all these frameworks at the same phase, for me, if you care about performance, is unacceptable. But some guy can say, well, but uh, Spotify used that. Yeah, Spotify is a desktop app, not a web app. They use web technologies for a desktop app. So it's a completely different case, and in that case, if you are building a desktop app using web technology, maybe micro front ends, it's the case for you. But for most of the case, I don't believe that's a good idea. Uh, so, uh, but can we have uh, technology independence, technology isolation, without blowing up completely performance? That's one of the questions that we were dealing with. And we saw some cases, for example, the IKEA case, where they show how they were doing micro front ends and they they, they passed it, pass it by almost everything that I just said to you, and they said that they, ooh, they ended up with a model where they have one micro front end per page, just one per page. And uh, each team takes care of one page, and this page can have whatever uh, framework and dependence and everything they wanted for this page. So they have this kind of uh, technology isolation. Uh, but I think that it's still not optimal, but it's performance, it's performance is still gonna be harder than normal. Performance is harder no matter what framework or what you are doing, if you are doing a big, great app. Uh, but it's at least possible to, do, to deal. This model at least is something that we can try to deal with the minimum of web performance. So it's gonna be even harder, but it's possible. Uh, so the question is, is it worth does it pay the price? Does we want to use that in our company? And, uh, and another question is, does we really need this technology isolation for all the, the, the places, in, for all the teams? So let's talk about, moving on to that, what is uh, autonomy and technology isolation? So it's an important thing to, to answer. Uh, what we really want, I believe that almost everyone here agree, it's autonomy. That's what's important, <laughs> autonomy. Once we want to do our job without asking for permission for everything all the time, and we want to have our square, we can, we can do whatever we want most of the time. So with the context that we have there. So it's a philosophical question. Uh, does we need technology isolation to be autonomous? And people can agree or disagree with that, think that yes, maybe no. But yeah, I think no. <laughs> and most of the people, um, uh, normally big companies, they usually think that no. 
And most of the companies have technology constraint on their context. Even the big jazz tech companies, for example, Google, they have five different languages that you can choose if you want to start a new project there. We cannot choose uh, the new hype language of the moment. You cannot choose a new, uh, maybe you can start a new framework there, but you cannot just uh, choose another framework just because you want, because you were in a conference and some guy said, oh, it's the new big, big thing of the moment. So uh, I think that autonomous thing doesn't mean to have freedom to choose your favorite technology regardless of your context. We must uh, think about our context when you are choosing technology. And I believe that's big, it's uh, very important, mainly when you are t talking about big companies. And well, I believe that if you want to use microphone ends just as an excuse so you can use this, the newest hype of the moment, I think that's, that's, there is something wrong about that. You know, that couldn't be the, 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 the reason why you want to use microphone end. But sometimes contexts do require the technology isolation and that can be a turn point for most of you right now. That thing, uh, that were thing that I was just saying to you, no, not, don't use that. And sometimes there is context. What, what for us you know, in Itaú, there was the context that required that. So we had two different scenarios. The first one was security. We have a, a b very big security and, uh, and uh, a security team that works with components and services, and they must have uh, is isolation. And it's always gonna be a requirement for them. When they need to update something on, on their stack, it's because there is some fraud, something that needs to be cared I'm as fast as, uh, as we can, must have an independent deployment, must have uh, complete isolation because they do require it to have some strange technology because of the, their requirements. So on, at least on Itaú, that's one of, on one of the main contexts, main context, and it's always going to be. That's not something that's going to change in the future. And there was a second context where we wanted to put new features at the legacy and we needed to start doing that right now. Uh, you know, we are always dreams about the perfect architecture and how can we scale in the, in the best way, all the things inside the bank, but sometimes we need to stop dreaming and just start doing something with the tools that we have now. So, and we thought that microphone tens could be a very good tool for this case. We, are, we want to evolve the legacy system, we can't wait for the perfect architecture for that. And so we, the teams needed to that to start doing things without break the, the whose legacy systems that we have and even with each other. Uh, but still, uh, for us, we put some requirements to use the same framework, the same stack, the same dependence, even if they are completely isolated in different repositories even, they uh, needed to have uh, some defaults and some common things so uh, one engineer could move on to uh, some other projects without discovering everything all the time. So it was important for us. And the main thing that was that uh, enabled us to do that was the web component API from the HTML5. So it, for us, it was the perfect thing to, to glue everything together because the web component API, it's a native feature and it has its own way to deal with uh, isolation and m makes that uh, you are the, putting that, the things that you are putting there, they, this doesn't affect the rest of the things. And even for older browsers like IE that happily we need to support, uh, there is some polyfuse that does most of the things and solve most of the, the things that the Web Components API de does naturally. And do, for do that, we use Angular uh, for all the front ends and all the, the things on Itaú. And we did that using a model of Angular. The name is Web Elements, Web Angular Elements. So we have there a model of Angular that makes you compile any component that you wrote in Angular to a web component. So you could write uh, the, the, the whole application as you normally use it to do in Angular, and you get the roots of your application or 
any other component and compiles that to a web component, build it in a single, uh, in a single file, put that single file in a script tag in a page that you want to use that and use the tag of your web component. And the, the place, the, the guys that is using this tag, and no matter if it's a JSP in the back end or anything else, it doesn't need to, to know if it's a Angular, it's a React or anything else. So for us, it was the perfect clue to do that. There is other ways to do to deal with micro frontends, and the other guy here talked about some of other strategies. But that for us was the perfect, the the most right decision for us. And but actually, we are not convinced by, for this method for the long run. So okay, people start to do it now, and that works, but. We still have difficulties to deal with performance, as we said before, with this model. We, don't, we didn't want that to be the perfect solution for the long run. So still people are doing that right now and doing new stuff on the back end, on the legacy code right now. We were talking about already the future. So what's the future for our micro front end architecture? Because we like the, the, the idea, the core idea of micro front ends. It's very good. Uh, but Autonomy, we wanted autonomy, really, really care about that. But technology isolation has its own problem. So if all the microphone ends has its own version of Angular, it has its own version of all the dependence, and for example, we want to update the version of Angular or some dependence that has some, some critical bug that can have some security issue on application. How can we do that, that massively? How can we scale that to, to update all the micro front ends that we wanted, that you wrote? So it's a very important thing for us in the long run. And we wanted a better way to deal with all this dependence, not only external, but internal. How can one micro front end affect the other? How can we test that in a good way? So we want to automate all these uh, tests and all these integrations. And so here's a question. What is the version of Angular that Google's use? What is the version of React that Facebook use? Do you know? What is? It's always the last one. They don't care about version. Actually, if they didn't open source their code, they probably doesn't even add a version. They doesn't care about it. And do you know where, how, uh, why? Because they use monohepo. And most, mo a lot of people here are doing that, if this looks for me. And you started talking about micro front end, and now you are talking about monohepo. What's happening, William? Are you crazy? And well, actually, almost all the big tech companies use monohepo. Facebook, React, uh, Facebook, uh, Google, uh, Twitter, and a lot of people, a lot of these companies have uh, only one mm, uh, monohepo. <laughs> they have a monohepo for all their applications, for the whole company. Not different monohepos, but they have one monohepo for the whole company. So, and even, for example, Microsoft, they, they, they doesn't have a, a monohepo for all the company, but they do have big monohepos uh, for different sectors and different places and different subjects. So if these people are doing that, probably there is a reason and it's not a hype, you know? <laughs> and so, and all those companies, probably most of these companies that use monohepo, they also use microservices in some way. So. Probably, it's not something that they, they are reversed for another, it's not an incompatible uh, thing. So if they use microservices, they, we probably can use micro front end uh, as well. Shouldn't be a problem. So, uh, and we don't intend to magically transform the whole Itaúni Banco in a single uh, monohepo. Uh, it's, it's something that we are testing, and maybe in the future it can happen, but it's not happened for a long time. But we believe that for some groups, for some uh, microservices, for some uh, areas of the bank, it may be a solution to deal with this dependence. So do you know that image? I really like of this image. And I really think that teams should have an, 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 an aim, some subject, some objective in the company, and these teams should be responsible to the whole cut of its responsibility. So, but in, at this point, if you look at that, there, 
it's in, in normally people that are talking about this uh, front micro, micro front end and looking to this image, they normally are thinking about using all these micro front ends or microservices normally for the same channel, for the same app. And actually, we are talking a lot on, on Ibanco on omni channel or multi channel or how can we use uh, uh, the same code for a lot of different places, channels, and apps, different apps. And it becomes harder and harder to, to, to manage that. And we believe that uh, MonoHap would help with that. With using mm, different micro front ends to different apps and channels. So let's talk a little bit of, as we're talking about uh, MonoHap, let's talk about how can we scale. Uh, the same repository because it's not just easy. You're not something, you know, okay, so we decided to use MonoHapo, just, just do that and doesn't think about the consequence. There is a lot of consequence on that and we need to be careful about it. So uh, we, we need to, to think about baby steps. How can we do it one step after another? And one of the ways we can start experimenting MonoHapo is thinking about workspace. So. There is a lot of tools out there that have this concept of workspace, of you have different libraries and uh, applications at the same repository, at the same place. And actually on the Angular CLI, uh, this concept there is for a long time for a lot of uh, versions. So we have that already. So we started to do a lot of proof of concept with the Angular CLI to, to, to try some things like, for example, can we have independent builds for independent feature apps that are uh, micro front end for itself that can be built, tested, and deployed independently, even at the same workspace, at the same works, uh, of the, at the same monohapo, and we did all this proof of concept, and we managed to do that. We proved that it were possible to do all of these things and scale that uh, uh, it was possible, uh, and not only for sure for Angular. I'm not doing just talking that you should use Angular to do that. It's possible for all the microphones, all the frameworks out there. Uh, and we were able to do that and prove that, but for enable, in order to really get that to the production, to the whole process, uh, we, we needed to automate a lot of things and customize a lot of things, a lot of things. And Angular CLI, it is extremely extensible. It has a low level API to customize it, almost everything. And you don't need to, to drop off the, the, the CLI uh, anytime if you want to customize something. But customize that would take a long time for us, and then we decided let's research a little bit more before, before put our hands on the code, customize everything. Let's see what, what does, does we have uh, out there. So we discover a tool, very good, uh, very cool tool. The name is Lerna. Uh, I believe that it's made from Facebook, and there is a lot of cool uh, open source projects using Lerna out there. Uh, I believe that Babel and a lot of other uh, famous projects, and with that, uh, to the, you can have a lot of different technologies, a lot of different applications, even if in different frameworks or a Node.js application at the same repository, and it have, it have a lot of tools focused on uh, workspace, focused on MonoHapo. And it's a very cool thing that you can uh, start and uh, use it a little bit. And we really like it of it, but, uh, we need you. We, if you use that, we would need to customize another other set of things that Angular CLI had already, or make make it, all these things work together. And we we researched a little bit more after that, and we discovered this tool, the NX, the extend, extensible uh, dev tools for MonoHapo, and it is actually a collections of two builds on top of Angular CLI for MonoHapos. But it's not only for Angular. Actually, it has first-class support for many front-end uh, frameworks and even for back-ends, Node.js, and other frameworks on Node.js. Uh, and it has supports for, uh, specifically for MonoHapo. And it's using the Angular CLI behind the scenes uh, because it's extremely extensible. So for us, in a, in a front-end, using the, the Angular framework would be perfect because we would have the both, uh, the better of these both words. And one of the most cool things about these tools for, um, uh, for monohepos is that uh, a lot of people say uh, things that, oh man, you are gonna be, gonna be 
crazy. You are going to have everything together in the same repository, and you will not know what depends on what. But actually, this NXSUS, it can give you a graph of all the interdependencies between your projects in, uh, in the same monohepo, and it can even show, if you are in a pull request, for example, which uh, of your ed uh, edits, which of the things that you have edited on this pull request affects which uh, of the libraries. So in this case, for example, I did an example editing this admin feature permissions uh, library, but then it shows in red also the admin and admin and, and twins because it both depends on this library. So uh, this way, we can have a single a continuous integration uh, run, but you, you, you just run the build, the tests, the integration tests that you need for your uh, edit, for the things that you are doing at this pull request and not the whole uh, monohepo and build everything together all the time, that would be crazy. So, we can have this graph with this NPM run deep graph once you have NX installed on your monohepo. And you can run only the affected builds uh, of this pull request. And you can run all the tests of the affected applications in parallel with these commands. So th it's a very powerful tool for that. Uh, and we are working right now with uh, one of the first pilots uh, to try these tools uh, for a big uh, monohepo in uh, back office tooling. So, but let's talk a little bit even in the future. That's our thing that we are working right now. But even in the future, uh, if you have a really big monohepo, if you really like of this on it, it would be uh, sometimes difficult even to manage the the, the Git uh, repository or to uh, sometimes you edit something that uh, needs to build a lot of different things. So. There is a lot of tooling uh, from these big companies that are using Monohepo for a long time. For example, Bazel from uh, Google, that's open source, but there is some open source tool from Facebook for Monohepos, from Twitter, uh, that they can run all the builds of all the affected applications at the cloud. You can configure a cloud. They can build and cache uh, just build at the cloud for you. So even if you are a low-end uh, laptop, you can uh, build something and it's going to be built on the cloud and you're ju just going to run the things that you do to need on your machine. So that's the future. That's not something that we are doing, going, doing right now, but it's a direction that you're probably going to be taking if you really like of this strategy. So all the reference that I have, all the studies that I, most of the articles that I read and I discussed these on uh, application, it's here on the reference. Each of these are a link. I'm gonna share these slides on my Twitter so you can find me there and you can discuss about, we don't need to agree with everything that I said and it's completely fine. And I, we don't have questions here, but that's my Twitter account and thank you. <laughs>